Hi Bobcats! In this video we're going to take a look at the scientific method. Um, I realize for some of y'all this is something you've seen since elementary school. Um, other people may have encountered this much later in their academic careers, but probably everybody has seen something about the scientific method somewhere along the way. And I'm hoping in this course we'll be able to take a bit deeper dive into um, the way that science is usually done. Our objective for this video is to describe the processes that are used in science. Science and technology are two very closely related disciplines. Science is a way that we learn about the world around us, whereas technology is the application of science for some sort of practical purpose. So a couple of examples I'd like to throw out to show the relationship between science and technology. Um, well, the first one is fermentation. Fermentation is a process um, where yeast interacts with sugars and produces alcohol and carbon dioxide. Um, and so it's been probably um, just the last couple hundred years that we had a, a real scientific understanding of that process. Uh, but the practical application of fermentation would be creating things like beer and wine and other alcoholic beverages. And um, beer and wine have been around a whole lot longer than our scientific understanding of fermentation. Um, another example where the technology came long before the science is combustion. Combustion means a type of chemical reaction where a fuel is burned. It's reacted with oxygen and it releases a lot of energy. We've used combustion um, for thousands of years um, for heating, for cooking. And so these two examples show us a scenario where technology came before science. That's a point I'd like for you to remember for our final exam. Um, I guess because we covered this right at the beginning, of course, um, this is something that students tend to forget uh, by the time the final exam rolls around. Uh, but um, in this particular example, uh, technology came before science. But it doesn't always have to be that way. So to give you an example where uh, science came before technology, um, I want to introduce a couple of other vocabulary words. Basic research versus applied research. And a good way to think about these two types of research is science and technology. Right? So basic research is the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake. It's like, I don't have an immediate application. I can't uh, immediately make a product from this. Or I can't immediately um, make somebody's life better with this. But this just seems really exciting, and I want to find out all about this. So an example of that um, came in the 1920s, where two scientists, Stern and Gerlach, discovered that the nuclei of some atoms have a property known as spin. Uh, they sent a beam of atoms through a magnetic field, and they discovered that some of these atoms kind of veered off one direction, the other atoms veered off the opposite direction, and they were able um, to explain that by proposing this property known as spin. Well, here's the applied research side of this story. Right? Applied research is work that's oriented towards the solution of a problem, and we're looking at some kind of immediate application of this. Well, in the 1960s, Lauterbur, Mansfield, et al. Um, created a new way of looking at what's going on inside of your body, known as magnetic resonance imaging, based on nuclear spin. And so the basic research from the 1920s then was applied to create a new tool for medical use in the 1960s. So in the context of our final exam, this is a case where science came before technology. So we can go either way. Science can come first or technology can come first. So scientific methods 
are illustrated by this diagram. And I do want to put the emphasis on, oops, my pen is getting away from me here. I do want to put an emphasis on the S at the end of scientific methods. There is not a single linear path through this that we call the scientific method. Um, instead, it's a description of an overall process, and there are many, many paths through this process. So you might start off with some sort of a question. This question may be based on something that you just observed in nature. It might be based on something that you observed in lab while doing an, some kind of an experiment, and this particular thing wasn't what you were looking at just at the moment, but you're like, huh, that's kind of weird. Um, I wonder what's going on over here. And then you create some sort of a hypothesis about that question. Um, often these hypotheses are formalized as if-then statements. If I increase the temperature, then this reaction will go faster something along those lines. Um, then you go and you do an experiment that's designed to test that hypothesis. Well, things can get complicated here, right? After you do this experiment, it may turn out that that experiment didn't really match your hypothesis. And so maybe you go back and you change your hypothesis. Or maybe you think, huh, this really didn't answer my hypothesis. It didn't test what I wanted to test. So I'm going to design a new experiment. So there may be some cycling back around here. Then you might actually formally do the experiment once you're, you're, you've settled on your experimental design. And you get a bunch of data. You make a bunch of observations. Based on your data or your observations, you may think, wow, my hypothesis is not correct. And, but it would be correct if I made this change. So after you have this data, you go back and you create a new hypothesis. Uh, maybe tweak your experiment some. So you just keep cycling uh, through these steps. And finally, after you've done a whole bunch of experiments and you've gathered a whole bunch of data and analyzed it, you come up with some sort of conclusions about your experiment. And honestly, my own experience in doing scientific research tells me that usually by the time you're reaching conclusions on a study that you've done, Along the way, you've generated a whole bunch more questions that you now want to go and answer. Let's see. There we go. And so the main take-home lesson that I'd like for you to have from this slide is that uh, the scientific method or methods um, this is not a linear process. It is very cyclical. So to try to emphasize the cyclical nature of the scientific method, I found this diagram on the internet, uh, which is just another way of structuring the same concepts that I had on the previous slide. But I think in this particular diagram, that cyclical nature is a little bit more obvious. Some of the characteristics of science include things like scientific hypotheses are testable. In order for it to truly be science, you have to be able to do some sort of a test. And we use a special name for that, which is an experiment. So these tests that we do generate tons and tons of experimental data. That data must be reproducible to be considered scientifically valid. What this means is that if I do an experiment in a lab in San Marcos and some other scientist does the exact same experiment halfway around the world in Beijing, China, we have to get the same results. If we're not getting the same results, it's not science. One of us is doing something wrong, we're, we're doing the experiment differently, but if it's truly scientific and two completely different labs are doing exactly the same thing, they're going to get exactly the same result. Another characteristic is that scientific theories are tentative and predictive. 
um, we can never fully prove a scientific theory. We can disprove them, but we can never fully prove them. These theories are our best descriptions of what's going on based on the data that we have available to us. As more data become available, then our theories will evolve. And the fourth characteristic here is that scientific models are explanatory. We use models to explain things. For instance, we can use the atomic model, which is illustrated in the, the bottom left. Um, that's, I believe, the, uh, a model of the molecule known as methanol. Um, and we can use the atomic uh, model to explain things like why a balloon will expand in its volume when it gets heated and why it'll contract in its volume when it gets cooled. Another characteristic of science is um, how we determine what is wrong and what is right, um, or what science is and what science is not. Um, one idea supported by data is correct in science. So for instance, um, if we're looking at what the shape of the Earth is, the idea that the Earth is a sphere is correct. We have uh, visual evidence from astronauts in space uh, who have taken pictures of our planet, so we know that a sphere is a good description of the shape of the Earth. Yes, yes, I know it's not perfectly spherical, but it's close. So just go with me for this argument. Um, and any other idea about the shape of the Earth is wrong. For instance, um, if you were thinking that the Earth is flat, that is not correct. And we can't both be right. We can't say, well, yes, the Earth is a sphere, and yes, the Earth is flat. Um, one idea is right, the other idea or any other idea is wrong. The way we determine what is right and what is wrong is by doing an experiment. We look at that experimental data, those experimental results, and that will determine what is right and what is wrong. Things like the most popular idea or a vote or politics or an authority figure saying this is correct. Um, that's not science. Um, those things do not determine what is right and what is wrong in science. No, experimental data determines what is right and what is wrong. Well, why can't we use the scientific method to tackle things like social justice and economic problems and political problems? Well, those things are often based on opinions and values which are not scientific systems. You can't go into the lab and do an experiment on politics and get reproducible data. It just doesn't work that way. And sometimes um, people get confused because if you were to put all the faculty members in my department in one room, so this is gonna be like 35 people with advanced degrees like PhDs in chemistry, you put us in one room and you throw out a scientific issue, you're probably going to get about 60 opinions that are all strongly argued for. Um, scientists are human and so scientists are going to disagree. And the more complicated or complex a system is, the more likely scientists are to be in disagreement. Um, it's really, really difficult to control or even to model all of the variables in complex systems. Um, money and politics play a huge role as well. Um, politics control the purse strings uh, since most science is funded by government money. And so um, sometimes you can get money to study something and other times you can't get money to study something. So we've circled back to our objective slide. Um, the objective for this video was to describe the processes that are used in science or the scientific method.